All right, uh, we're winding down again. Uh, let me review my end of the semester schedule in case there's any questions about it. Um, <coughs> we have class today, all right? We do not have class Thursday because of Thanksgiving, all right? We have class next Tuesday, which would be December 2nd. We do not have class December 4th. All right. Um, I am going to be gone from December 4th through December 7th-ish, whatever that Monday is. I think it's the 7th. Um, I may or may not be able to respond to email. So send the email. If you, if you have the need to send me an email, and if I can respond, I re, I'll respond. If I can, I won't, all right? So if you don't get a response, just realize that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm semi-incommunicado at that period of time, all right? Um, the drop-dead due date for everything, unless you've made previous arrangements, will probably be something like Thursday of the week of December 7th. So that would be December 8th, 9th, like December 10th-ish, all right, if, if my mental math is oh, correct. Thursday lands on the 11th. Okay, the 11th then. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm a day off, I guess. I know why it is. I'm traveling. Okay. I, I was going to say, how am I a day off? But I, I'm leaving the 7th and getting back the 8th. So I was thinking I was getting back the 7th. But I'm, I'm, I'm leaving my destination on the 7th, and I'm back in Ohio at, on the 8th. So that's how I'm a day off. All right. So again, don't hesitate to ask, ask questions. I have deliberately not made, I, I debated up until like the last minute, should I add another assignment? And I came up with the decision of no, I'm not going to add another assignment that I would rather you focus on, on really, you know, wrapping things up that you have not completed or maybe there's some loose ends or incorrect or whatever and getting your, your project wrapped up and finished and tested and, and so on. So no new assignments. What the assignments we have are the assignments for the semester and focus on getting those wrapped up. If you have those wrapped up, uh, work on the project and do a real bang up job on the project. I apologize again, as usual, this time of the semester I've fallen a little behind. Um, that's part of the cost of me giving the opportunity in this and other classes to rework stuff and also my policy of being flexible. You know, it would be a lot easier on me if I just said, no, you know, you, you, know, you got it wrong, you got it wrong. Or if it ain't due on the due date, if you don't have it in by the due date, forget it. I mean, I could probably keep up with grading, at least in theory, if I did that. But uh, I don't think that's the best way to learn. I know other teachers have different policies. That's fine. You know, it, it's, there, there's something to be said with meeting your deadlines. But there's also something to be said about learning the material and getting it right. It, it's funny, you know, how many times do you hear that an operating system release is delayed for one reason or another? You know, and it's like, well, you know, the pros miss their deadline sometime, and I can't hold students to higher standards than the pros, you know. Um, all right, so what we're doing today and what we're doing Tuesday. Today we're going to cover some, and I like to do this in a lot of my classes, a couple textbooks that I use do this. They have a chapter on the stuff that they have not covered. All right, which seems ironic because isn't that kind of covering it, but no. They have a, stuff, a chapter on the stuff that they have not covered. So I want to talk about two things that I haven't really talked about in class, but are valuable tools that you can use and you could, you could integrate into a website. Um, again, there's no way, maybe three things. There's no way that I can cover everything about ASP.NET in one semester. And in a way, it's frustrating. Uh, and it's frustrating that, you know, in associate's degree programs, there's really limited number of courses that you can have once you get the gen ed requirements out of the way and the, uh, you know, the core requirements of CISS and, and other kinds of stuff, you know. We really could go over a lot more stuff, both about 
ASP.NET and really about any topic that I teach. All right? But we got to cut it off somehow. But you know what? It's just like your vacation. No matter how long your vacation is, you always wish for one more day, right? I have three-day weekends every weekend because I don't teach on Friday typically. Every Monday, it's like, oh, if I just had today off too, you know? <laughs> and I did the exact same thing when I had two-day weekends, and I suspect if I had five-day weekends, I'd be saying that. So there's always more that we could teach. So part of the job... I think in doing this is to, is to cultivate the skills that you need to be able to take what you've learned in one context and maybe extend it to another. And that's one thing I hope from the project. Maybe you'll run into something that we haven't talked about exactly in class and we can talk about how you can come to a solution on it. All right. At any rate, the three things I want to talk about today are I want to talk about MVC. We'll give that a very quick go through. Second one is themes. We'll give that a pretty quick go through. And then we'll talk about AJAX. Um, today is the day for the evaluation, so you'll also fill out the evaluation form at the end of the class. Next Tuesday is a work slash demo day for your applications, all right, So bring, uh, for your projects. So bring in your projects to be able to work on them. Work on them. It will be a good inter uninterrupted time for you to get assistance on it and so on. But you can also show it off to people so that if people look at it, they may ask, how did you do this? How did you do that? I know I've been working with some people on their projects. And I've seen some really good things. And everyone could learn from looking at everyone else's stuff from a variety of perspectives, whether it be from the de design perspective or the technical perspective or whatever. All right, so that's our plan over the next two classes. All right, let me think. Ah, MVC. MVC is a different strategy of developing web applications. MVC stands for Model, View, and Controller. Model refers to classes, custom classes, that implement the business logic. I prefer the term problem domain logic, but people usually say business logic because, you know, so much is done for businesses. But really it's any problem, right? You know, you could be working for a nonprofit organization and developing a website. And it seems weird to call that business logic because they're not really a business. Or you could be working for a school and the school's not really a business. Or you could be working on some sort of scientific and it's not really a business. So I prefer to call it problem domain logic. Now some of these con uh, concepts we've explored in some of our classes. Um, in, in some of the techniques we use here. For example, the tuition calculation, where you developed a custom class. You developed a class that contained problem domain stuff in it. All right? In other words, this is, this is how our organization calculates. These are the rules. These are the logic for how our organization calculates tuition. All right? The model view controller design pattern sort of takes this to the nth degree, and you do a lot more with that. So the model is the business view, um, the business logic view, or the business logic perspective, or problem domain perspective. The view is the user interface. The model also, by the way, connects to persistent storage.
Then finally the controller is sort of the boss or the glue, if you will, that connects these other components together. For example, let's say we would have um, for our nonprofit a page to make a donation. All right. Let's consider how that would work from a, a model, um, model view controller perspective. Our user interface would be the form that you would enter your donation in, right? The, you you'd put your name in, you'd put your credit card number, you'd put in how much you want to donate, um, all the relevant information, expiration date, that little ID number on the back of your credit card, all that stuff. The user interface would contain that. The model would contain how you process a donation. All right? So what happens when you process a donation? Does it get, you know, I'm sure there would be things such as you validate to make sure the credit card was a valid credit card and it wasn't a stolen credit card. All right? Uh, hasn't passed the expiration date. The three-digit code and zip code that the person types in matches the records and so on. And you would probably update a database table saying that such and such person made such and such donation on today and so on. So all the guts of the processing of a donation, all the stuff that you would do to process a donation, that's like the business logic or the business rules, right? That would live in a set of custom classes. The controller would be code that would connect the two. So, for example, when I press this button, create the appropriate objects, and call the appropriate methods to process the donation, getting the values from the user interface. So it would take the user interface, the credit card number, all the information from it, create instances of these objects, and tell the object to go do its thing. And then report back if there were any difficulties or if it went through correctly or whatever. All right? So that's sort of a very high-level view of how the model view controller um, exists. How is that different than what we do? We do separate things into components with web forms. By the way, the opposite, or not the opposite, but the alternative to models view com uh, controller is, is a technique that we call web forms. That's what we've been doing. How is models view controller different than web forms? It's different because in our code, we have done a good job to a degree separating stuff. All right, we can make business objects. We have our code behind and our ASP page, but we got some things that are kind of tangled up a little bit. Like, for example, um, we have database interactivity that lives in our user interface, right? When we go and create a grid view or a details view, we have a SQL statement that accesses the database and does a query and so on. And that statement lives in our page, all right? So let's say, for example, we had a query of donors, all right? You know how sometimes on a website they're like, here's the people that donated over $10,000, here's the people that donated over 5000 and so on. Let's say we had a query or something like that. We would have SQL code in our user interface. <clears throat> From a peer's perspective, that's not really good. We can do better for that. What it would be better to do would be to have a donor or a donor list or whatever you'd call it object and have the view get populated not directly from the database, but from asking the model object, 
hey, give me a list of donors over $10,000 or whatever, so we can put them on our gold star page or whatever we call it. So again, this is just an extension. You know, this is a newer technique to do it. It, like any technique, in some aspects, in some, uh, in some, how do I want to say? In some respects, it's simpler than web forms. In some respects, it's harder than web forms. So, Miles View Controller is one thing um, that that you could do. That that would be a topic again, if we had an advanced class or if we had. And I know you're all looking forward to this. If we had another month of the class, you know, I know you'd all love that. But if we had another month of the class, that might be, that would likely be one of the topics that we would cover. All right? Okay, next thing to look at, themes. One thing about ASP.NET that is maddening in some respects is, and we've explored this before, but you have a number of different ways that you can set some of the visual attributes of things. You can, for example, use plain old CSS, like we've been doing in CISS 216, where you can create stuff like, you know, classes and IDs and HTML tag style rules. The other thing you can do is you can put your styles right on the ASP.NET controls. There's sort of a third way. And that third way is using themes. Now, I generally like the more straightforward CSS way. CSS is a web standard that, you know, that enables you to have the potential to develop the most efficient code you can. All right? But... There's actually a couple of drawbacks with CSS. I won't say drawbacks. Drawback isn't the right word. Limitations, maybe. In order to use CSS, we have to be able to, in essence, point to one of three things to define our selector. Our HTML tag. In other words, hey, I know that this grid view makes a table. Right? So I can apply a style rule for a table, and that grid view will get that style rule. So that's one hook from the ASP.NET control to the CSS, is we know what HTML is going to generate. Another hook that we have is the ID. Gee, I know this table has an ID of table 1, so I can write a style rule for table 1, and it'll take effect. The other way is we've seen with most um, ASP.NET controls, there's a CSS class field where we could define a class. Like, I want to make this a warning label. So I'll give this, this label uh, a class of warning, and then I'll develop a style rule for warning, and um, then it will get whatever style I want to make any warning label get. So those are my hooks, and you can do them in combination and all that, you know. Within a navigation, you can make a unordered list look a certain way. And in that way, you could style the ASP.NET menu control, because those make unordered lists. And if you put it in the nav section, you can define it that way. But there are certain things that are hard to get a hook for. For example, to do like alternating lines of a grid view is sort of a classic situation. All right. It's difficult to style that, but via themes, you can style it. Themes also give you the ability to sort of theme your website or skin your website, where you could go and put, allow people to choose between a, a, a list of possible views of their website so they can customize it. Let's spend a minute doing this. Let's look at an example of ASP.NET themes, and I do have to confess, I probably use ASP themes like once a year, or twice a year, fall and spring semester, so I'm a little rusty on them, all right, so I, I will need to look those up. But let's go in and let's theme our summer league site.
let me make a, I think this is the one that I want to work <coughs> on today. I'll set this to start page. Tell you what, I'll make a brand new page. Not sure what's going on here. I'll, I, I think I think the, I think I picked a page that does something different than I expected it to. Let's do a new page. That simply has a list of all the players on it. So I'll pick a web form. Set a start page. Grid view. Put a SQL data source. Configure data source. It's going to be a habit for me to, like, narrate what I'm doing, partly because, you know, I mean, sometimes it's hard to see exactly what I'm doing on the screen, so I do that. Plus, it's good just to sort of keep my mind on track, but I wonder, I haven't noticed, I wonder if I do that at home, like if I'm, if I'm making a grilled cheese sandwich, like, take the bread out of the package, all right, turn on the stove, you know. I don't know, I'll have to notice that, I'll get, I'll get back to you on that. All right, so now I can go and do this. And I'll set that as a start page. And I'll run that, and we'll get a grid. All right, just the two people. All right. So, I'm going to go and I'm going to create a theme. So, I'll go File, New, File, and I will pick a, I lied, I will pick a skin file. Yeah, a skin file is a file to use in ASP.NET define an ASP.NET theme. So I'll add that. You're attempting to add a blah, 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 blah. In general, you should put it in there. Do I want to put it there? Yes, of course I do. All right. Now, what we can do is, and they even give you a tip, which I, I'm greatly appreciative. Default skin template. The following skins are provided for examples only. Name the, the control skin. The skin ID should be defined because there are duplicate skin IDs per controlled or not. All right. What we can do what we can do is we can specify for certain controls what certain attributes get. All right. So, oh, see, something told me to use a grid view. I must have remembered that the example that they provide you it does it for a grid view. This says that I want to make the alternating row style of this grid view that I apply this skin to, I want to make the background color blue. All right. I'm not going to apply the theme yet. Let me just run this. 
And to be sure, there's only two people in this table, but it would work if there were more. If I look at the HTML that, that this creates, I really don't have any hook that I can apply a style sheet rule to the alternate rows, right? At least not in, again, I would, I would need to look up if CS, CSS3 provides anything better than this. But using regular CSS, you know, CSS2 and earlier, there's no hook that I have that I can make alternating rows a different color, right? Because they're TRs, but so are the other rows in the table. I don't have an ID for each row, so I can't assign it by the ID. And in fact, even if I did, that wouldn't be a good idea because what if the row had 50 tables? I wouldn't want to have to supply 50 IDs. And there's no class and there's no way to put a class on that TR. I could put a class on the entire grid, but I couldn't put it on the TR. What I can do, though, is I can define a theme. And I can say, so there's no hook that I can put regular, you know, I can put CSS on. But I can define a theme, and I can define a theme for things such as the alternating row style. Now I can go in and I can specify for this grid view or do I specify for the page? I can specify that skin file for the page. Let's see how this will work now. and it does not do anything. Oh, skin ID. There we go. There we go. So I can specify that skin ID, and in that way I can control the things that I could not otherwise control via CSS. So you'd have to, for grid view, for example, you'd have to put the skin on there? Yeah, you'd have to, you'd have to tell it to use that skin. All right. Now, of course, you could do something where you set the skin dynamically. You know, instead of saying this, you know, I am hard coding the skin to such and such. If you wanted to give flexibility to allow the user to pick their own skin, you could give, um, you know, that could be a variable. They could pick from a drop down up there. You could store it in a session variable. Or you could store it in a cookie and, and, and so on. But that, in a nutshell, is how themes work. Has anyone used themes at all? I played with it. What did, what did you use them for? Uh, just trying to learn how to make them. Okay. Work. I did a tutorial, all right. and I played with it. Right. The, the advantage to me is it allows you to, to, to fairly easily style stuff that at least, uh, again, well, this is a good thing to Google. I wonder if there's something CSS3 alternating rows table. Actually, it looks like there is. So, again, um, we can through CSS3. Do, do that to get, to get alternating rows. So, but there are some other things. If alternating rows is handled in CSS3, which I kind of half suspected it was because it's a pretty common thing, there are other things that are difficult or impossible to style using CSS. And the themes is a way that you can do that. You can define a skin and associate that with the skin ID. All right. The last thing in our whirlwind tour of miscellaneous ASP.NET topics is AJAX. Can anyone tell me what AJAX is? I did not want to do that. So cleaning stuff. It, it, well, <laughs> I'll give you partial credit. Had you said, 
Had you said that Ajax was stronger than dirt, I would have given you full credit. That's one kind of Ajax. What's the other kind of Ajax? Isn't it a, a group of languages together? It's not really its own. It's not its own language, right. There is no Ajax programming language. It's more of a manner in which you, you, you apply languages in a web environment more so than a, a language of its own. Ajax stands for, I've heard a couple versions of this. stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Although I've heard other people say it doesn't mean anything at all. They just made up the name. So asynchronous. JavaScript and XML. Because it doesn't really use XML either. <laughs> right. But it does use the XML HTTP request. So in that respect, it does. Let's find an example of Ajax I'm sure you have all seen. And let's consider this page from our standard client server model. Remember the big the model that I drew up on the board a hundred times. You have a client that makes a request for the server. The server does its thing, runs its scripts, does whatever it needs to do, and then sends the data back to the client. All right. That is sort of a clunky interaction. By clunky, I mean it's an all or nothing sort of interaction. Every time you talk to the server, you get a complete new entire web page. All right. So that's kind of clunky. What's much more streamlined is Ajax pages, where instead of getting back a complete page, you get back a part of a page from the server. And the client then formats the data that it gets back from the server and displays it on the page. This plays into the strengths of both client and server technologies. What are, what are the strengths of server-side technologies? Servers do the heavy lifting. Her servers do the processing, the database interaction, all right? What I would call the heavy lifting of an application. What is client-side code good at? Client-side code is good at taking a page that's already been delivered and tweaking it a bit, right? So you have drop-down menus or, or, or mouse over menus. You put your mouse over a menu and boom, it, it, it drops down, all right? That's something that client-side script is very good at because it can happen immediately. You don't have to wait to go all the way through the internet um, to get the new page. And you don't really need a new page. You just need the current page to look different. Well, here's a classic example of Ajax. As I start to type in my Google search box, it shows me a list of things that are the most common search terms for what I've typed in. So I type in P, and the top four choices apparently are Pinterest, Pandora, PayPal, and PNC. I type in PH, and the top choices are Photo Bucket, Photoshop, Pharrell Williams, and Photo Editor. I then type in a P, and I get the top choices, PHP, PHP Date, PHP My Admin, and so on. Hit a space, type an F, and so on. Now, if we examine this from our traditional client-server model, this page doesn't make sense. Because this page isn't redrawing the whole page every time, right? You can see the page flicker a bit when it redraws the whole page. Like if I hit a refresh, you know, or if I hit a refresh here, see it flickers a little bit. You can see the status bar saying it's going to the server. Yet when we do this, all right, 
the page isn't flickering. So it's not refreshing the whole page. And yet, we know that this can't be done completely client-side because we certainly have no way on our client computer to determine what the most popular Google searches are that start with an A, an AS, an ASP, an ASP dot, and so on. That's heavy lifting. That's reading some database out there and determining the most popular queries for that. So this is a slicker version of the client-server interaction. It's a more seamless, it's a less clunky. In a nutshell, and again, this isn't an AJAX class, but I want to sort of paint the picture of what AJAX does before we show a specific example. In a nutshell, what AJAX does is it allows you, allows the client to make a request to the server not for an entire page, but for a piece of data. So when I type in ASP.NET, AM, and so on, I'm asking the server, give me a list of the top four search terms that start with ASP.NET space M. Not an entire page, just give me that data. Just give me a chunk of data. And it can be formatted a number of different ways. One of the ways it can be formatted is the X, XML. All right, but it can be formatted in other ways as well, depending on the specifics of, of the application and, and, and other, other, you know, other characteristics of the problem that you're trying to solve. So the, the, the client makes a different kind of request to the server. The client does not make an HTTP request. An HTTP request, which is the re kind of request you make when you type in the address bar, or the kind of request when you click a link, is a request for an entire web page. This is a different kind of request. It's an XML HTTP request. And that is saying, hey, don't give me a whole page, give me a chunk of data. Maybe an XML, maybe not, but give me a chunk of data. So the server responds to that, and the client, when it gets the response back, it formats the response. So when I type in a search term here, all right, I could have done any number of things with that search term, right? It just so happens I put them in a drop down over here, right? I could have displayed them across the bottom of the page. I could have made big text across the middle of the page. It's up to the client's responsibility to format it how we want to format it. All right? So we have a slicker, more streamlined more nuanced version of the client-server interaction. The client makes a request to the server. The server sends back not a complete web page, but some data, and the client formats that. Now, you can write the code to do that all yourself, but being a good framework, ASP.NET does this for you. So let's do a quick example of an AJAX application. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an AJAX page here. I really wish we had, you know, really wish we had like tons of data that we could, we could do this better. But I'm going to create an AJAX page. And I'm going to put on it two grid views. I'm going to put a grid view that's going to show me all the age categories. All right. I'm 
this is the, as they say in, 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 in experimental or research context, this is our control. This is the old school way. This is the non-Ajax way. This is the way we've been doing grid views from the beginning. I then am going to pick a update panel. All right. In my update panel, I'm going to put a second grid view. I'm going to put a, and I'm going to put everything in, in the, the update panel. And I'm going to put a search for a person in the player table. All right, let me make sure the code is right. And by code being right, I mean I want to make sure everything is within the update panel. The grid view, the SQL data source, the text box, and the button. All right, everything is. So I can go and configure those things. These are going to be my Ajax things. All right. So let me go here and I'm going to create a SQL data source. And select star from player where last name like question mark plus a hard-coded percentage. So that, if I typed in a Z, it would match Zellers, but not Gomez. All right. So it's looking for the wild, the wild cards at the end of the expression I typed in. I go and say that I want that to come from a control, and the control I want it to come from is a text box. Test query. Z brings up Zellers. Okay, good to go. Choose data source. SQL data 2. I'm going to set this as my start page. Then I'm going to run it. Needs a script manager. My bad. So I'll put the script manager there. Is that instead of the SQL source or in addition to? In addition to. And I'll put that at the beginning of my update panel. two times a year, so I forget <laughs> a couple things. All right, so here we are, and how do I want to put this? The top grid view is only going to be refreshed when I reload the whole page, because I put that outside of the update panel. The second grid view will get refreshed via an AJAX request, all right, and it will not require the refreshing of the whole page. 
So if I type in Z here and hit button, it may be hard to tell, or I type H and I hit the button, it's not redrawing the whole page. You don't see any flicker, you don't see any status. Here's a way to prove what I said happened, happened. I'm going to go out and I'm going to add another age range description. Go into the database. Okay, so I added a new, nothing up my sleeve. Now I go here, and I do a search for the person. This name starts with Z. I click the button. It's going to pull up Zellers in the second grid view, but it is not going to pull the new category into the upper view. Why? Because I'm not refreshing the whole page. I'm only refreshing the stuff that is in the update panel. So I click button, and there we go. It brought me up. It refreshed the stuff that was in the update panel, but it did not touch that. All right? Because that's not part of the Ajax request. This is something that's retrieved only when the page loads incomplete from the server. So if I were to hit refresh, then I would get the new category. So let me hit refresh, and there we go. We have the third category. So that's sort of proof to you that that middle, that, that, that second thing being updated is being updated without refreshing the whole page. All right? It's simply asking the server for a piece of data. The server's providing that. And the .NET control is slick enough to make all the changes for you, as opposed to you having to code them. Yes? Is the drop-down that Google has just a live updated drop-down then of some sort? I mean, Google, when you start typing it, it'll... Yeah, absolutely. And in other words, what they do is I was initiating the Ajax in my case is clicking the button. Mm -hmm. What's initiating the Ajax in their case is the key being pressed up. So when the key goes up, that is the user event that fires off and asks the server, okay, now I have pH in the text box. What are the top five searches for pH? Now I have PHP. So every time you're typing it, a little message goes to the server requesting a little piece of data, and it gets back. And again, on a fast internet connection, that happens so seamlessly, it, it acts like it's a desktop application. All right? If you had a case where you were not connected to the internet, or you had like a really bad, or you dusted off the old 300 baud modem, or something like that, as you were connected, you would notice a noticeable lag from the time that you typed the key to the time it redisplayed it. But keep in mind, what is it displaying? It's displaying four search terms. That's not a lot of characters. So even on a slow internet connection, Google's going to be responding pretty quick to you. All right? So it, it will, even on a slow internet connection, it's going to still be a fairly seamless look. Again, the whole idea of Ajax is making a more sophisticated interaction between the client and the server so that you don't have to refresh the whole page, that you simply refresh the part of the page that you need to. And you don't have to, again, re-retrieve the data, so it's going to be quicker. Um, you let each actor in this transaction do what they do best. Clients are good at formatting and changing a page. Servers are good at doing the heavy lifting, doing the database interactivity and, and that sort of stuff, and sending back pieces of data. All right, questions about this? These are all topics that I wish I had more time to go over. Yeah, Ajax. Ajax is extremely cool. It, it has much slim. And, and you'll notice, like for example, if you're on a Facebook page and 
you comment something and you notice a second later there's a comment under yours, that's probably done with Ajax, where it, it's looking and it's not redrawing the whole page, but it's looking to see periodically is asking for, are there any new comments? Are there any new comments? Are there any new comments? And then if there are, boom, then it pops it down. Or like Gmail, for example. If you're sitting there looking at your Gmail screen, you don't have to hit refresh every 10 seconds, you know. It'll pop up as you receive the uh, uh, thing. Or I've seen like on ESPN where like you can uh, um, sort of get like a text commentary of like what's going on in the game. Not necessarily like a play-by-play, -play, but you know, Browns had the punt, you know, Falcons missed a field goal. You, you know, you get that. You can actually just leave that up and, and again, it's an Ajaxing. It's not redrawing the whole page, it's just refreshing a certain section of it. All right, I need a volunteer to take the evaluations to the office. All right. I, I have a question for you real quick. Yeah. Um, it's kind of not related to this, but it's an issue that I'm having, I'm having an issue finding the answer to. Um, like, for instance, my login section consists of two text box and a button uh -huh. and a website. How can I put that in some type of a container to where I can just set everything inside that container and move the container where I want it to be on my web page? Do you know what I mean? Because I find myself happening, I make a container for it, make a nice border for it, but then I, if I want it to be at the top right, for example, I have to set the text box to here, set the next text box to here, set the next button to here. Is there a way that you can just put it all inside one thing and manipulate that one thing and it'll move all things within it? Do you know what that, I mean? Yeah, yeah. That is a good question. What you would probably do is you'd probably create a div uh -huh. for it. Uh, what I'm thinking of is if it's going to be on literally every page, you could create a div for it. Or actually, you could put it on the master page, mm -hmm. put a div <laughs> in it, and then just have different styling for it to, yeah. sh to show it. it now, I do put it inside of a, a div container. Now, yeah. is, is it not moving everything at once because I set the things within it to uh, fixed? Probably, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to look at it, but probably that's why it's doing it. I was thinking of switching it to static, and then I thought it would move with it. Yeah, uh, and, and that's the thing. Part of the part of a, a skill in um, CSS is knowing when to not style things and just let the browsers do what browsers do. You know, browsers are good at figuring out how to put things on pages. It's real sophisticated the way browsers work. It, it really is. You know, it figures out there's enough space for it and it does that and all that. Now, granted, we want more control than just letting the browser do it. Right. But you want control on the level of that container. All right. So therefore, you would probably have minimal or no styling on the stuff inside the container, and you do all the styling, and just let the browser handle that part of it, and then you do all the styling inside. Okay. Or I mean, for the container. All right. Let me save.